And hello everyone, welcome to the Warburg Infusion Entertainment Review. It's time for episode 73. I'm one of your hosts, Thomas, a.k.a. Mr. Warburg. And alongside me, as always, is Patrick, a.k.a. Mr. Fusion. Greetings and salutations, um, aliens, earthlings, anything in between. Yeah, any 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 species in the Federation or otherwise. Uh, or otherwise. We're, tonight we're going to be talking about Star Trek Strange New Worlds. Of course, we are live over at twitch.tv slash Mr. Warburg, my personal channel. We got Pathos in chat. He's waiting for a football game to kick off, so he's chilling in chat while we talk Star Trek Strange New World Season 2 because the finale aired yesterday. We're doing this on Friday, August 11th. We're going to talk the finale. We're going to talk Season 2 compared to Season 1, our hopes for Season 3, plus how bad the writer's strike's going to affect everything. There's a lot to talk about. It's a fusion. Um, since I've done the intro here, what was your thoughts on the Strange New Worlds finale? We'll start specific with our finale reactions. Uh, what was it called? Hedge hegemony. Hege Is that? What? It depends on how you say it. Like they would hegemony? say the gor the gorn hegemony or hegemony, like hegemony. moni. Okay. Like like yeah. you say it, like the second e is different. Like hegemony. and then that affects the o depending on okay. how you say it. My guess okay. would be hegemony. hegemony. Would be how you're supposed yeah. to say it, but there's yeah. there are different pronunciations. And this is like deep space, so anything can be pronounced in any weird way. Um, I thought this was a fantastic finale to a Star Trek show period. Like not a show itself, but I mean like a season season finale. I, I'm going to echo what you said earlier in the week, or even last episode when we talked. This is arguably the best Star Trek show ever. Mm -hmm. This is the first two seasons of this show have been absolutely fantastic, man. And this episode which, spoiler alert, is now, it's a two-parter. It's a to-be-continued, which, you know, we get those from time to time in TV shows, and I think it was it's kind of a lost art, that makes sense, because I think we create cliffhangers, like in the Netflix binge era, where the cliffhangers are a little less, they're, they're a little less cliffhangy, if that makes sense, in terms of, like, we know that the story, there's something that we kind of leave you with, but it's not, like, immediate. It's kind of like, I think Glow is a perfect example of that, which a show that didn't get to do their final season, but it ended on a cliffhanger, but it wasn't like, oh, when the next season kicks off, it's immediately going to start right back up, right? Same thing with Stranger Things. We know that they're not going to immediately start off right where season four ended, right? This is cool because come season three, episode one, boom, after the review of the show, you're going to get right into what's happening, you know, in this battle. And I'm cool with that. But uh, are we going to just leave out the big reveal here, man? Because, uh, I geeked out. I really did geek out. I don't know if you want to. If you oh want to yeah, after. we'll get there for sure. Um, okay. But yeah, like to to piggyback off your point of uh, of you know like two parters. Obviously, this one it's like it's it's all stakes. Like you said, it's how they yeah. set up the stakes. Like most streaming shows set up the cliffhanger to leave you the taste for more because they literally don't know if they're coming back. Exactly. Where Strange New Worlds, they got greenlit for season three before they even started season two. Like Paramount. Right to their credit with this show specifically, they've got some other issues with Trek, but, and just how they're running their IPs. But they were like, oh damn, this show is fucking awesome. People love this show. The cast they went loves into production, making this right, show. They went into production like a month and a half after they wrapped on season two. Like it wasn't like they- Yeah, like they were ready to shoot. Like yeah. the scripts were done. Everything was locked. Sets were built or digitally built, whichever. So they do with some kind of volume kind of stuff that what Disney sure. does. But and it's very prevalent in an episode we're going to talk about, one of my least favorite. But uh, there's, they knew they were going to go in, and then the, they were going to do season three. The day they were going to start shooting is when the strike started. Yep. So they were able to craft the story knowing, oh, season three is not just a given. It's going to happen. We have the money. We have everything. We know how to make a two-part story. And that's a, that's a classic Trek thing. Like, remember Best of Both Worlds? That cliffhanger? Everyone lost their minds with, you know, Captain Picard's abducted and like the, the Federation might be like going extinct because the Borg are this big bad that we've never seen before. Right. And then they come back three months later and it's the rescue of Captain Picard and it's fucking awesome. Obviously, with the strike where it's going to be at least 18 months before they get back to it, you know what I mean? Like before it's actually because they would do all 10 episodes post-production editing and then release it. Obviously, Paramount doesn't want to wait that long. They want to go as fast as possible, but you can only rush it so much. Even though a lot of the pre-production's done, you still got to shoot the damn thing. Yeah. You know, like, that's going to take time. Yeah. So I 
I, it'll be a longer wait between season one and two, I'm sure. Which well, I think stinks. they were. I think they. I think they were trying to shoot when the strike. The strike happened. What at the end of June, early mid June? It was like July twelfth, wasn't it? Was it for July the actual SAG strike. strike. The writer yeah, strike think, was the much writer sooner. Was, but they yeah. had already. They was the scripts were done because they had started yeah. pre pre pro on season two, immediately after season one. So obviously beyond rewrites, which happens all the time, it is a show. Even just one dialogue of line changing, that's writing. Yep. So honestly, it probably is for the best that both strikes happened because yeah. then we're going to be able to have writers around the actors doing the show. So, but I think my, I think, I think their goal was to, because this started in the middle of summer season two, I think they were going to try to move it up to late spring, maybe early summer to, for season three. Like that was their goal. That's why they kind of fast tracked production for season three. But now, like you said, we're at least a year now. We're mm -hmm. at least a year out, if not more. I mean, uh, Stranger Things, the Duffer, the Duffer Brothers basically said, like, you know, they're gonna, the they're gonna have days, to they're gonna have to read two of the whole thing. Yeah, because yeah, they're really. all gonna be not just adults, but like fairly well into adulthood by the time they actually yeah. get around to shooting the last season. Yeah, so they're gonna have to rewrite a lot of their script story, like whatever their plot was gonna be for season for the final season of Stranger Things. It's gonna have to change a little bit further, which means like if you change the timeline a little bit for you know, age sake, then you, you change a lot of the story. Like it's, it, it, this is, I, this is a little different because, you know, we could, yeah, there's do, no kid actors here. No, there's no kid actors from one, but we could do the first episode to show the re like what happens when this battle with the Gorn. And then in ep you could fast forward either at the back end of episode one or into the episode two, like, because we know that we still have five years until Kirk takes over the enterprise. Well, right? you more know? like two or three, probably. Well, from what I saw reading reading uh, reviews of this of the finale, they're still in twenty two sixty. Okay. That's, yeah, they they show this as twenty two sixty because I would. Well, it, I would say like five years in universe. Probably realistically, if they ever do it on screen, it's probably two or three. Yeah. Because I don't imagine well, they're going to be able to lock up people. Well, I get for given that the long. story, given what happened in this in the this finale and what's going forward in season three. I think it's safe to say that we're going to start seeing more and more of those things, those elements take place in season three. Because <laughs> yeah. I think I think we're probably going to get maybe four, five at the most seasons out of this show. That's what I really think that they're going to, yeah. I think they'll cap it. Like and you're going to have actors that are going to go on to do bigger things. Like we've yeah. done, Jess Bush is going to go on to do something. And she's, yep. if, if they don't recast Kristen Ritter, she, I, she has to be Jessica Jones. I think like, she'd be great. She'd be amazing Jessica. as yeah. Jessica Jones. Yeah. She would kill that role. Yep. So, like stuff like that, like Anson Mount's probably gonna go back to do something with Marvel, right? Like, there's a lot of things. So, like, there's only so much road for the actual, on our side of the camera, like logistically, road to go. Obviously, in yeah. in lore, plenty of road, but like, yeah. there are people. They make the show. They have careers. How long do they want to do this? Not everybody wants to do the Jared, you know, Padalecki, Jensen, Eccles, be on a show for 15 years, kind of thing. Right. 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 Like that. That's a that's a rare breed. Um, so that'll be interesting, but now we can get into some spoiler stuff. So what was your take on the, obviously we've seen some of the, you know, future TOS cast in this show. I like Mbenga has been in here. Um, you know, obviously you have Uhura as a series regular and we've seen Kirk from time to time and Sam Kirk, his brother, who yep. really, we saw in TOS just what that was Shatner with a mustache, which was so dumb, but, uh, you know, like there, and obviously Pike is referenced, and you know, actual the first officer gets a name, right? It's Una Riley, Chen Riley. But what was your take on them introducing another TOS mainstay, and one of the greatest sci-fi characters probably ever in, Mister Scott? Montgomery Scott. It was great, man. Like as soon as he walks up and he says, "You're not the Gorn," I'm like, "Oh, it's Scotty, man!" Like I was like. And the great thing was they surprised us. There wasn't a big yeah. They kept that on they kept lock that under wraps, and I get why because, like I said, now I can just speak outright. I think in season three we're probably going to have that because obviously with Hammer dying at the at the end of season one and a Carol Kane's character, I forget her name now. Carol, what Pelia. Is Carol? Pelia, yeah, Pelia. She was. She's never like. She's a part of season two, but she's never really center stage she so was more of a I, recurring guest yeah i think that this has been a, obviously a, a perfect setup to integrate scotty into this universe like into, well into this iteration of it in strange new worlds and and i just before we started recording i did some reading and akiva goldman basically said yep 
he's going to be a big part of season three. And I'm like, that's all I wanted to know. We're not just going to get, hey, we're going to get a, a heavy cameo in this quick story and he disappears for a couple of years. No, like he's going to take a big part. He would be a big part of season three. And obviously we both have both have said this through the spoilers that Mbega, he at some point steps down as the uh, chief medical officer and just becomes a staff doctor on the Enterprise during TOS. So and we're going to tell that we've been kind of leading up to maybe there's something that happens with him and his past that, that causes that, which is a great story. It's a great way to kind of outfit his story into where he is now. We're going to have to get Bones at some point, right? It just makes sense in the next year or so to get Bones becoming the chief medical officer. And I liked the way they brought him in. It was fun. It was a good story. Um, his ties to kind of like getting to meet people uh, on the Enterprise and then, you know, uh, Pelia basically talking about he was one of my best students with just horrible grades, like things like that. Like he's just, he's a genius, but he's just like, he just doesn't really give a shit about school. Like he just is a naturally gifted engineer. Things like that I, I'm cool with. Um, yeah, it was exciting, man. It was a good cameo. I, mean, not, I say cameo, but it was a great introduction to him into this into the uh to this uh to this uh show it was it was awesome yeah you yeah. know like for me obviously i liked his performance and i believe he actually is scottish uh which is the first time well i think wasn't simon Pegg scottish no he's not no he's he's uh he's just he's, he did a scottish uh, accent yes he's brit his yeah. wife is scottish Whereas, yeah so but quinn actually is scottish it was he it's a different accent than his original accent though he's going for the more stereotypical you know what we think of scottish not like really what it actually sounds like because that would be yeah. that would be a big difference compared to what has come before in canon as scotty you know because obviously james duhan is canadian uh so and you know uh peg is not you know scottish himself so he's trying to be more of the stereotypical but it's still nice to have him be played by an actual scotsman but uh, yeah. i think they were more just alluding to scotty i don't think that actually was him in the first season too yeah, they never, they never really say. You just kind of think that that's him at some point. Well, I think it's supposed like, oh, to be a fake out. Yeah, yeah, it's supposed because obviously we knew a chief engineer, a new chief engineer was coming. It's supposed to be a fake out for right. introducing him. And Pathos is in our chat saying, didn't technically they already introduce him? And again, I think that was more just the the narrative fake out because then they were going to introduce Pelia later in the show. So, yeah. but uh, yeah, I thought the finale was really fitting. Obviously, we all kind of called the fact that the. Uh, what is her name? The captain of the Cayuga? Uh, Battelle. Battelle. Yeah, Captain Battelle. We knew she was going to be either... I thought she was going to just straight up die. Die, right. But I imagine she's probably going to... I don't know if they're going to have her pull through in the... You know, part two. Because, man, that was very on the nose by the trope of... Um, one Basically, one day from retirement kind of trope. Like, that was basically what happened. Uh, so it'd be nice to see them swerve away from that, but also maybe not because this is supposed to be a really dark moment for these characters. And obviously they've done that before with Hammer facing the Gorn. Does somebody else die? You know, like another one we haven't seen, like you mentioned Bone. We haven't seen Sulu. So does yeah. like Ortegas not make it out? And she she's played a heavy part at the back end of this of this season. Like she was getting much more screen time. Yeah, like, and and to another point, and this is something I've just seen on the subreddit, before we get into our thoughts on season two as a whole, and this kind of dovetails into that, what are your thoughts on this show morphing into the meet, straight Star Trek meet the TOS characters, not Strange New Worlds? Because some people do definitely take issue with that. Whether we're not telling uh, stories about this crew, we're telling futures about the future crew. Yeah. Mm, you know, I really liked this crew... But when you really think about it, you had Mbenga, you had Chapel, you have uh, Uhura. Uhura, so you and Spock, obviously. So you have four of the main, and Chapel was a secondary character in TOS. So I, I and Mbenga, a secondary Ooh. character. Um, but you have Spock and Uhura, which are really primary characters in both the movies and TOS. I would say it wasn't completely like you knew you were, you knew you were going to get there, and I think people I I think people were I think if it was at some point something happens to let's just say Ortegas, and then we get you know Hikaru Sulu showing up to you know to take her spot, I think people would it, it wouldn't be as polarizing had we not been introduced to Kurt so early last year at the end of the finale of last season, 
Like if we had waited to season three to get uh, Jim Kirk, I think people would be a little more receptive to kind of like this evolution of of the ship. But you have to think about the fact that when TOS starts, it's not like they it's just day one for the entire crew. We have to remember that. Yeah. Like some I of them mean, served on the ship before. Some of them before. came with Kirk. My guess yeah. would be we probably don't see Bones until the very end. Because I always got okay. the impression he came with Jim. Like yeah. they've been friends far longer than they either were on the Enterprise. Well, we could we could be introduced to him like in season four with him on his on Kirk's ship, like the other ship that he's an admiral on, you know? Yeah. They they work together on that ship and then they move over to the Enterprise. Yeah. So yeah, like, yeah, it was the Sulu and obviously Chekhov. We haven't seen him at all. Yeah. So, like, they're that's the main crew that we haven't seen. I did like the kind of the tying, you know, movie canon in with, you know, his Carol and his son and yep. that getting a drop this season. So, let's get into season two as a whole. Obviously, I thought for the finale specifically, one last thought there. They, okay. The Gorn were treated less like a horror thing here because obviously the meat of the story is about kind of like the background of it is like the Gorn as a species, let alone the actual like encounters with the Gorn. Like it's like an alien movie though. Spock on the ship had some similar vibes to that because they definitely need to start getting to the point where there's an actual relationship between the Gorn hegemony and the Federation. So they can't just be mindless killers. Like there needs to be a society there, like something that they can trade with and have negotiations with by the time TOS rolls around. And we're starting to get there because they mentioned that with the whole, maybe it's the coronal mass ejections, like basically just like m turning their brains to fight everything instead like of the mindless, mindless. Exactly. Killers. Yeah. So and maybe that's what gets them on the path to peace is the Federation figures out how to basically kind of save them from themselves. At, you know, and that's what gets them to kind of be at more standoffish, but not aggressive towards the Federation. That's and that's my thought in the first episode of season uh, three is what's going to happen is the the Enterprise is going to do something to quell whatever is going on with those with those those flares creating like this whatever it is rage whatever you want to call it and I think that's a, way, a perfect way to to kind of integrate Montgomery like Scotty into the Enterprise is to he be able to help them rather than let's just cloak ourselves and run it's like no we have to help them oh and like, you know maybe. he's got to have a scene where he can mess with the ship's warp engines yeah. to set the speed record you know like that's exactly. gotta happen exactly. you know so i mean you could i i really think that that's i'm on i'm i'm kind of along those lines that season the see, the beginning of season three is going to be them kind of coming to the aid of a section of the gorn and then that leads to whoever is is on that ship say okay i'm going to call you know a truce right now you know and a parlay or whatever you want to say and let's Let's talk, you know? And I think that begins the whole thing with where the Gorn become a little more peaceful with the Federation. And, and it makes sense. I mean, like you said, they kind of slip that in. And it's th it's those little nuances that in this show that they do such a good job of, like, they don't retcon so much of the universe and the characters and the races and all of that and the issues. They don't, they don't retcon so much of it, but they put little nuances to where you, you can put a little bit of a different spin on things, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, like they're That's not really... they're not like treating canon like this unbreakable thing. Yep. They're just yep. using that as like a, a guidepost. Yeah. Which I really appreciate. And so you know, they want, the one thing they really talk about a lot in this show is time travel. Like it happens quite a bit in the, because of what happens in deep space, time travel happens actually kind of reg, almost regularly like so wait, every somebody... every Star Trek series needs a time travel story. Uh, yeah, but what I meant was there's been a what well, we had what at least three episodes this season, and then you talk about at least two episodes last season. What episode? Oh well, yeah, you had the crossover. The crossover. Mm -hmm. You have the actual, the one with Laon. What other one happened this year? Uh, was there another? I'm trying to think of. There was one with Pike. I thought there was a third one. Well, yeah, the the balance of terror was the time the going forward. Forward, the forward. One, you know. Yeah. So the, I mean, we've so we've we've dealt with time travel as a plot device on multiple episodes, yeah. and there are there their own separate episodes. So it's one of those things where I think like, okay, well, you could and you know the the uh, the Lon one was obviously kind of resetting a few things, particularly with the birth of Khan Singh or Noonien Singh, right? And that's I I get it because it just 
from the timeline and where we are in our actual real time in 2023, a lot of it was starting to get complicated. So let's kind of clean that up a little bit. Okay, that was a good way to do that. So I think I think they've really thought out a, a good solution to maintaining that main timeline, but also not, like you said, it's not so ironclad to where you can't make adjustments and tell good stories outside of it. Yeah. Yep. So let's talk season two as a whole. Obviously, there are 10 episodes. Yep. What? Oh, and chat, you can chime in too. Uh, what is your favorite episode this season? Mine? Mine I mean, Go ahead. The, the easy answer is the uh, Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow, episode three, with Lon going back in time and meeting an alt Kirk, and then yep. you're dealing with all that emotional fallout. That's that's definitely probably my favorite. And then, honestly, the Under the Cloak of War is probably the second for me. So what about you? Braids is pretty up there, you know, where Spock is uh, loses his Vulcan DNA and becomes human mm-hmm. and uh, has to learn how to accept his emotions. But I'm going to say episode eight, Under the Cloak of War, absolutely love that episode. You might not have, I mean, it might, I, I, some people didn't really like it too much, but I'm all about hearing a little bit more about the Klingon War. I'm always a fan of like getting episodes and stories about the Klingon War. And that was a great way of introducing, hey, what Mbenga went through during that time and kind of his resolution with things, uh, you know, in, in the current timeline, five you know, years later of how he's had suffered from PTSD and just the politics that take place with war and after war that, you know, a lot of people had to accept that here because, you know, a lot of German, German uh, Nazi German scientists ended up coming to the U S to work, you know, and a lot of folks here had to accept that. And so it's, it's a, it was a really good, like kind of like a, a political storytelling that, you know, you can, re- a lot of people can relate to. And I yeah. It really made me want to rewatch undiscovered country too. Right. Oh man. That was, cause that was more analogous. That was a cold war analogy. This one yep. was more of a post-world war two analogy. Yep. And uh, so I, I really thought they handled that part really, really well. So it would probably be under the cloak of war would be the first one. Charades would be two. Cause that was typical humor, humorous Star Trek, which I absolutely loved. And then three, Tomorrow, 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 I thought was a brilliant episode as well. Like, just, hey, we get a really cool time travel story, but, like, we really get Kirk integrated into this universe, like, the Strange New World universe, and, like, there's the future that lies ahead of him. But at the same time, we kind of know, like, well, shit, like, while I'm celebrating it as a fan, I know that Pike's not going to be there, that uh, Leon Singh's not going to be there, that... Una Chin Raleigh's not going to, like, oh, man. And so it's kind of a bummer because I do love this cast of characters. Mm-hmm. I do. Yeah. I hope they'll able to be, you know, I can see, obviously, like we said, that some of them are going to go on to do very big things. But I hope Obviously. in whatever comes next for Trek, whether they do something new like Star Trek Legacy, mm-hmm. you know, set in an era we've never really been in before, um, I hope we see them again. Like, and it, it's a, you know, Star Trek, Star Trek territory where cast and former shows show up in others as just different characters, you know? Like, Admiral Forrest in uh, Enterprise was, like, three different Cardassians, you know? Yeah. Obviously, um, Jeffrey Coombs has been, like, how many characters, right? Like, four, you know, the guy's five. at least six. Okay. He was, like, four on Deep Space Nine. Admiral Shran, he plays an animated version, plays, a, like, a human version of himself in Deep Space Nine. The guy's in fucking everything, and I, I gotta imagine he's got... He doesn't obviously he doesn't want to travel, and this show films in Canada. And if there's any way to get him on a screen, at as at a conference thing, he doesn't need to be on set. You need to get Jeffrey Combs to play a character in a Star Trek show. It it just has to happen. If it doesn't, Paramount, what are you doing? So because he doesn't want to leave L.A., which I completely understand. Hey, this is forty six. He was forty six. He, he plays so many characters. He's Star Trek royalty. Yeah. Well, and he's he's been in a ton of slasher movies, like an absolute yeah, like a metric. And he was, kind of... and he was uh, the question on Justice League Unlimited. Absolute perfect casting. That is that is a great character actor, right? There. So good. He's he is he is the Star Trek character actor. Got to get him in something. And I could see a lot of these cast and crew showing up, you know, in different properties, or maybe in a maybe they do a TOS kind of revival show because obviously there's post five-year mission they could do and we see them again we catch up you know 10 years later with these characters that'd be pretty cool 
So, yeah, and Clint Howard showed back up this season. You know, he was in the TOS way back in the day. It was one of his he very first the, acting roles. Yep. He was and then like he shows up old. in this show. Like, that's that's Star Trek 101. Is people yeah. will show up again in different ways, and you don't know how. And those kind of, you know, that kind of interconnectedness is really cool. And obviously, it's a very sci-fi community thing, too. A lot of actors, because it's a lot of shooting in Canada, they show up on all the series all the time just because they're around and you can cast them in things. So it's pretty cool. So chat, we've got some other people saying, uh, the, uh, let's see, Chris says uh, he was a really big fan of Under the Cloak of War as well as And Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow. Pathos hasn't answered. I don't know if he's watched them all. Also, what's up, Rhoda? You're here too. Obviously, you haven't been watching Trek, so you need... You should, because it's an amazing you show. You miss it out. It's a great show. Yeah, it's one of the best. Like we've said, it's the best Star Trek series bar none. Now, on the on the inverse, we've gone through our bests. What are our least favorites? Fusion, how about you? I went first last time. Uh, I'm trying to think through now, and I'm going to have to. I'm trying to so I'll run you list. through them. I've got the list in front of me. Okay. So the Broken Circle was the Spock stealing the Enterprise, which is okay. incredible cold open. So good. With the, I thought it, I would think it would be obvious. We must steal the Enterprise. And then, boom, that intro. Yeah, that, that was yep. good. That was great. That was great. Second one was Ad Aspera. Ad Astra per Aspera. You know, the in the... Yeah, I can't remember. But it's the Unichin Riley trial episode. Start their courtroom episode. Yep. Three was the time travel tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Four was among the Lotus Eaters. That's mine because you can tell, oh, yeah, you guys are not shooting on a physical location. This is all digital creation. Versus, like, the sets on the ship are just, damn, they're well-built sets, right? Like, you can just tell. Um, Charades was episode five. Uh, Chris in chat says he wasn't a fan. I can see why not. It just, yeah. I personally, I felt it fit the tone of the show because they've got season one, they had the body, they did body swapping. With the right. logic, logic dictates we engage in hijinks. Like, that kind of thing. I felt it fit this show. Lost in Translation was episode six old set episode seven was the crossover under the cloak of war is eight subspace rhapsody the musical episode is nine the musical episode. and then hegemony is 10 so of those you what is your that, least favorite you notice i noticed that you didn't say the the the, the musical episode neither did chris and maybe i don't know if pathos watched uh the musical episode nine or not but it's not it wasn't it wasn't the worst musical episode of a tv oh, show it I made say that. I, I liked how meta it was yeah, it was meta, but it was logic. It was to quote Spock, it was logical. Like yeah. what they had to do. Like it was the kind of logic yeah. where they're like they figure out, oh, we're following the rules of a musical. We need an emotional moment. Spock hears this and immediately goes to find his girlfriend to start a fight. <laughs> like, yep. Well, that well, I guess there we go. So for me, I'm gonna say, man, I really thought about. I'm really thinking this through, and I didn't like the Among the Lotus Eaters too much as well. But I'm gonna say Lost in Translation. Did not like that one. I, I could really see it. I, it was very obviously it was an Ahura episode. But it was a, it was also it felt like we needed it and don't get me wrong, I think Paul Wesley is going to be a fine Captain Kirk going forward, whatever they wherever they put him in, in the show or on another show. But I thought this was like we need like I, I could see the studio saying we need to have a Captain Kirk episode. Like we need it. And so they bring him aboard and from the very beginning, the moment he comes back aboard the Enterprise, the it's it's about him and Ohura, and I just thought it was. I think they I think they were just forcing their hand a little too much. That in the episode's episode. logic, it doesn't make sense. Like, yeah. there are so many things that are like, they they've really made great pains to like tell logical stories in terms of characters act like competent officers, right? right. This one they don't. Like Ohura's just left alone, and everybody knows she's going insane. Oh yeah, yeah. give her a phaser and let her go back to her room. F fucking what? Are you right. crazy? Right. So yeah, that one and Among the Lotus Eaters are my least two. Now, I will say this about Among the Lotus Eaters I didn't like was the plot device that, you know, their memory was being... We're, we're told on the Enterprise that their brains are being damaged. And it's like, okay, once we stop the radiation, everybody goes back to normal. I'm like, I think that was a little too weak of Yeah, a that's one of those Star Trek hand-wavy ones that doesn't work. Yeah. They can get like, away with a lot. Because yeah. it's Star Trek, it's, you know, Doctor Who that, you know, don't get too hung up on the details, but some details matter. Like brain brain damage, we all know is permanent. And even if no matter what there's, no matter what in the very, in the, in the, in the, 
in the deep future what their technology is to help and heal people, that's fine. But they basically, like, halfway in the episode showed that, yeah, our brains are just rotting away because of this radiation. Okay. Okay, now that we've stopped the leak, everything is back to normal. Everybody's going to regain their memories. It's like, it doesn't really work like that, but okay, man. Like, that was that was a kind of a weak plot device. But like you said, loss in translation for me was, it just felt like it was a... Maybe it was lost in translation for me, but it felt like a show, like an episode in Limbo. A lot of it was just kind of like, kind of like, okay, we're hanging around. It's middle, like in the middle of the season. It just felt like it kind of was puttering around until we got to the next step. Like we were waiting for the crossover, the Lower Decks crossover. Yes. That's really what it felt Which like. Which wasn't, like, that. Um, that is my third favorite. Yeah. It's very good. But I do want to give a shout out to the show and just, it speaks to the quality of this show. Our two least favorite episodes have two amazing moments. Bach meeting Kirk, and then yep. bonding over the fact that Sam Kirk is very annoying. <laughs> like, right. That was that was awesome, right? Um, I loved like even Uhura meeting Kirk was very fun, right? Yeah. Um, and then among the Lotus Eaters, you've got the Eric Ortega's "I fly the ship" moment. Yeah. You know where she repeats that mantra over and over again, and it's very fun, even though it's admittedly uh, like that it's supposed to be a tense, you know, tense moment, but it's fun because it's a fun character. Uh, which sadly she doesn't get a ton of development, and I hope season three, we need an Ortegas episode at some point. I think we're getting. I think we're getting close to having an Ortegas episode. But that's what makes me worry is we're gonna get one and she dies. That's what. Well, that's because, my worry. Because we need to have Mister Sulu on board at, some at some point, point. or like, we just need to have him as a helmsman on another ship. Like they're just friends. Yeah, that'd be cool. And I, I mean, do well, wonder if they're going to carry over the. If speaking, and we'll get to, I'll get to talking about season one in general, but to get back to our circle back to the conversation about uh, future casting, TOS didn't really do much with Sulu's like gender or sexuality. And then in the movies, the Kelvin verse, they confirm like, hey, this Sulu at least, uh, you know, is in a stable relationship, has an adopted daughter with his partner. Do you think they're going to do that in, if we see Sulu, they'll set that kind of thing up? Trying to think this through. Because my guess show, would be yes. I would. I would say yeah. I would say just to con- and remember, like if they do this, this confirms that in the main timeline he is. Yes. You know, that's that's you know his his sexuality is now out there. I think if I you know I I heard George Takei talk about this a long time ago on the Howard Stern show, like twenty almost twenty years ago now, like seventeen eighteen years ago. Where another actor was like, "Hey, did it ever bother you that you had to play?" He was like, "No, man, because if you go back and watch those shows, like my character is fluid, and you you could tell that, and it's because you know Roddenberry didn't really want to kind of pigeonhole me, but just because that was that was uh, that was um, uh, Kirk's thing, right? He was a ladies' man, and that's his thing that worked for his character. So for my character, you kind of you have your moments, but then like there's a couple episodes there where you kind of like, oh okay. But my character was always fluid. We always talked about it back even way back then. Like maybe he he could be gay, he could be bisexual. Like we don't know because it is space. It's the future. Like anything's possible. And Roddenberry was okay with that, but at the same time, it was like we never found a need to tell that story. I'm like, okay, that's cool. You know, all right. Very different world we live in now in 2023. So I, I could see that being a thing that they do. Yeah, yeah, I do. So that's probably where I, other than, I don't because know what they want to do with Chekhov because obviously. Did we, did, did we establish that Ortegas is gay? Like I, I could have sworn that we, she's made a comment about that in season one or something. I could have sworn. I that, don't know. I could have sworn that, that she talked about her partner or something like that. It, like it was just like. A exactly. Comment. We don't know much about her. Yeah. So that'd be, yeah. an, that, I, we got to get something with her. And you know, the fans are clamoring for it. So they probably will do it in season three. Just so, don't kill her off because you're going to break Warburg's heart. You better not. Well, that, I mean, the backstory of the actress is like, you know, character, like just her as a person. You got to have her stick around. Yeah. Right. You know, because obviously after season one, she lost her husband. Or I think it was during season one's shooting, she did. And it was very sudden, like diagnosed with cancer. And then like, like, like a month later, he was gone. Like, yeah. and she still was like giving a performance, and everyone was like, "This character is fucking awesome, right?" And she was great, and she was great in season one. I oh mean, yeah, there She's was fantastic. a couple episodes where she just, just like they did. It. She wasn't even written in a few episodes, but like as the season went along, yeah, yeah we got a lot more of her. Yeah, I I like the character, I, I do, I really do. And yeah, you're right. It was it's a very tragic story what happened to her. So 
uh, what is it, Melissa Navia? Navia? Sounds right. Yeah, I'd have to look it up. I, I have a sheet, but I, haven't, I didn't write everybody's name down. So, speaking of season one, let's compare the two seasons here now that they're both in the books. Yeah. My guess would be your ta- my take in a way, at least, is that season one was a stronger top to bottom season. Okay. But that this is an extremely close second. Okay. What about you? What's your takeaway? I'm going to actually, for the third time on this episode, agree with you here, man, because season one, just the ebbs and flows of season one were just perfect. Whereas we had kind of a little thing where it kind of puttered into like the episode leading into the the lower decks crossover. It just felt like that was kind of just like, it almost felt like the studio said, okay, we're going to do this, let you guys do this lower decks crossover, but we want our episode. We want We want a Kirk episode before we do that. Okay. Let's put it in there, you know? So here's your Kirk episode, and bam, here's Lower Decks. Like, here's Jonathan Frakes and Lower Decks. Bam! Like, yeah, because okay. those last like, four episodes, bangers. And it's yeah. the wildly different. Yeah. But. So I would say I, I agree with you where it was, season one wasn't like it's season one and then a distant second is season two. It's very close, but I'm going to say season one was just damn near perfect, in my opinion, in terms of like just Star Trek storytelling from start to finish. It was, yeah. I mean, we get, we opened the show with Montana, you know, Pike and Montana. Yeah, that was a strong Pike open. Pike. Like, it was good. That pilot episode was really good. Yep. So, yeah, I, I agree. I, yeah, like I said, I think just the, there are a couple episodes that kind of drag this season down with everything else, even the, but they weren't bad. Like, I certainly didn't turn, turn them off or anything. You know, like some of the Discovery stuff, I'm like, I just, I can't get through this. It's just the storytelling doesn't work for me. It's not, I'm not saying the show is bad. It just doesn't work for me. But, yeah, the, even the, those two worst episodes, like I said, still had some great moments. So I'm hoping season three comes quickly. But obviously with the strike, shrug emoji, who knows? Uh, we'll see what that happens. But I do want to talk one other piece of Star Trek that I saw on the news that absolutely floored me. Did you know Timothy Oliphant? Like, was, if it hadn't been for Chris Pine, he would have possibly been cast as Captain Kirk? In the Kelvin that. movies. In the Kelvin verse, he, he, because oh, he, the only reason he didn't is because he was too old. He, he's I, he's not that much older than Pine, but he certainly looks a little older because uh, his beard went gray like, sooner, basically. I think I think he's like fifty, early fifties, and Pine's 55. in his late forties, isn't oh, that's he? True. Like they're not that far apart. You uh, know, no, Pine's only forty-two. He's young. okay. But yeah, he's but he's starting to get the you know the beard gray and you know like. That, He's getting you look older eyes, when that yeah, happens, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, you know? Yeah. So, but then that got me thinking. How crazy, like, I would have, like, comparing now this Anson Mount Pike, I'd have been like, oh, shit. That would have been awesome if he was Captain Pike. You know what I mean? Like, if you had told me coming off Justified, Timothy Oliphant's going to be in Star Trek as Captain Pike, I'd have lost my fucking mind. That would have been incredible. But I didn't really know Anson Mount beyond a few small roles that I'd seen him in. But I would know who Timothy Oliphant is. And those small roles were uh, Black Bolt both times. That, and he was also the lead in uh, Hell on Wheels. Yep. But I didn't watch that show. It was, again, one of those shows that was on the same time as Justified. I just didn't watch it. But, uh, I, like, you would have, I would have lost my shit had I found out he was getting cast as Pike on, like, A Strange New Worlds. But then he shows up in Star Wars in the Mandalorian armor. <laughs> It's like, that's fucking crazy. Like, that's cool. That's cool. I'll take that. You know? Yeah. So, but and yeah, like getting justified. We, we're getting him in the justified sequel. So yeah. And I want to talk about that in a little bit. Cause I'm watching city yeah. primeval, but that was just yeah. some news. I was like, damn, that is, that would have been crazy. It was kind of a kind of like, uh, you know, Tom Cruise was almost cast as Iron Man kind of thing. Like that's who the studio wanted. Like that. I think, if, I think it was closer to like Eric Stoltz, Stoltz being Marty McFly. For the like for ninety percent of the production of Back to the Future, and then they just said nope, we can't. It's not working, and they just kicked him out like with only a few weeks left, and started over with uh, Michael J. Fox. Yeah, that's crazy. But I, 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 what I mean is, it would have been a very different film. Like yeah, the, it wouldn't. Yeah, he. I, they don't have like the same Stokes, energy. Stokes was isn't a horrible actor, and like it wouldn't have bombed. It just it would have made it, it would have made Back to the Future a completely different film. And I think Timothy Oliphant would have made Stranger Worlds a little different, you know? Like, oh, yeah. A little different. Yeah, because Anson Mount, I mean, that guy, I, I don't want to take anything away from his performance. I'm talking, like, retroactively, before we have seen the show, Yeah. how I would have reacted. Because Anson Mount's awesome. Like, that dude lives and breathes Star Trek. 
I love but that you know, there was a season one thing where he, they're like, yeah, between takes, he's just like diving through memory alpha and like, oh yeah, this reference is that, connects to that from that episode. Right, got it. And like, just he just knows that shit because he's a Star Trek nerd. And I fucking yeah. love that. Well, you awesome. know, he's, he's, he's charismatic, but he's not overtly to where he, de he demands the camera on him where Oliphant would have had that. And I'm not saying like he tells him, put the camera on me. Well, yeah, and the studio just, would have demanded it. Because I mean, he would have been presence. the name. Yeah. Right? You know, coming off Justified? Are you kidding me? Right. You know? Absolutely would have. Santa, Santa Clarita Diet and Star, exactly. Star Wars. Yeah. Yeah, like, he would have been the the name. So, yeah, I think it fits the ensemble better that he, like, someone like Anson Mount was cast, but I love his performance. But anything else you want to touch on Strange New Worlds before we get into some of our more what we're up it's to and a, watching talk? It's going to be a rough, kind of like a rough what, 14, 15, 16 months until we get season three. Well, Strange New Worlds is right... Or not Strange New Worlds. Lower Decks is right around the corner. So that'll buy, get us over a little bit. Yeah, that's that's true. That's true. But once we get past that, and Prodigy, which I... But I can't watch season one. Like, I don't even know where season two is going to air. They aired the preview with the fucking Doctor. Are you kidding me? You, you canceled the show that's going to bring back all the Voyager cast, minus seven, probably. Like, are you shitting me? Are we never going to get to see Captain Harry Kim? Is he going to be an ensign forever? That's, That's the joke. Come on. So I do hope if Prodigy, you know, kind of dies on the vine, which it sounds like it might, because I just don't know who's going to pick it up. They haven't announced it yet. That's worrying. Yeah. I do hope we see other characters in Star Trek Legacy. You know, at least at least what's going on, like on a pad, like on, on a, like what they're up to. You know, like an X ship captained by X person, and it's it's a Voyager name, because if Seven's going to be in command of that ship, you need that kind of connection to the Star Trek history. But uh, yeah, I was, honestly, I just really love Strange New Worlds. Everyone should watch it. Yep. And I've been I've been loving the fact like I was chilling in a, a friend Chloe's chat, and she does not watch new shows, but we were talking in the chat about like shows we're watching. I was like Strange New Worlds finales this week. I'm excited. And then like five or six people were like, "Oh fuck yeah, that show is awesome!" I'm like yes. Everybody watch it. The show rules. Star Trek rules. All right, let's get into some of our other stuff, like what we've been up to this summer. Like, things have come out. Obviously, we did last episode, we did TMNT, Mutant Mayhem. We didn't really talk much about uh, Good Omens, though, because I watched season two. Okay. Really enjoyed that show. Obviously, it's it's shorter because they're they're not pulling from existing source material. You know, there were some notes on a potential sequel from... Ratchet, uh, that would have worked with Gaiman on season on, on a second book, but that never came to fruition. So it's really kind of just uncharted territory. So it's only six episodes. They're a little longer, but I think it really works. I think it's a great little six episode story, and I'm hoping season three gets picked up because with the tease for season three is very intriguing. So about you, what do you, what's your big you, what you've been up to and watching in the last few uh, weeks? As as we got as we're getting. Closer and closer to football season, it's on the horizon. I've been kind of gearing up with a lot of football content, doing a lot of reading, looking at a lot of tape, looking at a lot of prognostications about the season. But I also have jumped in on the Johnny Manziel documentary on Netflix, as well as the quarterback TV show uh, series on Netflix. And that's some good stuff, man. Some really good stuff. Like, it's so crazy how now, and I, and I, I think it's a combination of HBO's just history of putting out good documentaries and good sports like HBO Real Sports, the uh, this is the NFL. Their stuff has always been top notch, right? But then they started doing Hard Knocks, and I'm not a fan of Hard Knocks, but I get why people like it. But they've done a few more sports documentaries, and then Netflix jumped on the scene, and they've done in. in but it, I think I think like kind of like where it really took its footing in like just in terms of like show production is uh the 30 for 30 stuff by espn they've done some amazing sports stories right bo jackson being probably my favorite one but this like opens up the floodgates of telling these stories like with johnny manzel kind of coming a lot of things coming to light like you know we we heard that you know johnny didn't really give a shit about money growing up because his parents had money you find out in the documentary spoiler alert that his parents didn't have money it's because companies were giving and agents were giving him a fuck ton of money, but they were giving it to the parents under the table, like shit like that, right? That he never watched and he refused to watch game footage 
You know, he refused to watch film, and no wonder he didn't succeed in the NFL. Uh, things like that. Uh, a lot of sports stuff, man. But that quarterback show is also cool because uh, it, it you, you might want to watch it. I don't know if you have or if you want to, but it's got a whole season dedicated to like last season. Uh, Kirk Cousins uh, is it? It's like his year. Um, Marcus Mariota, Patrick Mahomes, like it tells their story through all of last season, leading up to of obviously Mahomes and the Chiefs winning the Super Bowl again. But good stuff, man. Yeah, good stuff. Getting all ready right. for football, man. Yep, same here. Um. I did my wing stream, which turned yeah. out fantastic. God, I love doing my grilled wings. They're so good. That'll be my game one food for sure. Grill my wings. But uh, also watching Justify the City Primeval. Yep. Which is finally getting some good momentum as we get towards the back part of the season. Episode six is this coming Tuesday. And I'm really enjoying it. It's not quite as good as the entire run of the original Justified, but that was such a just awesome show. I don't think this could live up to that entirely. But it's still a really fun miniseries centered around a fun character with Timothy Oliphant coming back as Raylan Givens. Um, also been playing a lot of Baldur's Gate 3. I have 28 and a half hours. I finally got up to the point where I can do a... Their leveling is not my favorite as a video game. It's a little too grindy, like just a touch, but enough that it's annoying. Like it's one of those, the small thing that's so fucking annoying. Some mechanical issues that I have issues with as a video game. The party system is not, not not good. The fact that I have to go talk to every single person. Hey, you need to leave. Then I go walk to the other side of the camp. You can join me. What a pain in the ass. Not a fan of that. But the actual mechanics are really fun. And I'm quite enjoying my time in really one of my first real D&D experiences. The, you know, table, like the general get together with a group of friends to play D&D. It's never worked for me. It doesn't engage me up here. But seeing it does. So this is working for me really well. Yeah. You going to jump into it at all? I thought about it, man. But like right now with, with football. It is dense. Just, there is hundreds yeah. of hours of content. And that's just yeah. one playthrough. Uh, yeah, I just I think maybe like in the wintertime, probably I'll jump on it later, like in the year, probably around Christmas. Because, you know, but then again. I might find myself jumping into the NBA, you know. I, I think this year my fall is going to be much more sports heavy as it hasn't been the last few years. Rockets look like they'll be good, man. Astros, hopefully they're in a, they're going to make another deep playoff run, so my my fall will probably be busy with sports, man. Yep. And college football, once we start doing the the sports podcast, we'll be talking a lot because we have a lot to talk about in terms of just just the conferences alone, man, but And like, just my team with all the gambling team, shenanigans. And then my team with like the potentials to actually make waves in both the Big Twelve and the SEC next year. Like, it's there's a lot there's a lot of stories going on in the sports world, and I'm cool. So, yep. Yeah. And like for me, for sports, I'm sure I'll be watching the Twins extend their postseason losing streak. Like it's just, it's insane. Eighteen straight, eighteen straight postseason. Not not series games. Should not be possible in modern Major League Baseball, but it happened. And they've been good teams, too. Like, some of those yep. Garden Hire teams were legitimately good teams with yep. great pitching. And they kept losing. Yeah, it's there absurd. Was, there were those years where Maurer and Morneau were... Yeah, were... that was the start of, this, of the losses when they kept getting swept by the Yankees. They had yeah, fucking Johan like, Santana. Santana. They were a good team, man. Like, is insane. Ugh. And I'm sure they'll they'll hit 21 this year if we get swept. And they actually and they still and they had a he was eight he was in his 30s at that point, but they had Tory Hunter who was a really yeah, good on. Yeah, like they had some great teams, and they just yeah. kept running into the 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 prime Yankees with Jeter. Like, yeah. damn, it was very frustrating as a Twins fan. I bet, man. And it's even worse now because now we're not as cheap. Now the Twins aren't as cheap as they used to be. They were cheap as fuck back then. Don't even talk to me about that era because that was the hundred loss years for the Astros back then. Like I was just like, whatever, dude. Yeah, and now now the Twins are spending money and they're still not winning in the postseason. Hey, hey, hey! The ca Cashman and the Yankees said we're going to stop spending money because it's not working. Well, that and they I mean, kept. They're going to get. Don't they get? They're in the. They get taxed, right? Yeah, every well, every team that every team above the luxury tax threshold gets taxed, and they're but they're fine because they have a shit ton of money from the Yes Network. But with that said, they're just. They're, they've realized that the Astros and, you know, the Angel, Angels. It's almost and, like know, developing draft picks is good. Yeah. Yeah. 
It really, I mean, and the thing is, is that you know the 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 Rangers, the Dodgers, and the Yankees, they've given up really top prospects over the years, and they're like, okay, maybe we should just build it up from the bottom up and see what happens. Yeah, you know, we've made we've made, but, but they are going to have to go break bank if they want Otani this year. Yeah, but hey, you that's, probably don't that remember. sweepstakes is going to be bonkers. You probably didn't realize this, but in the, in the there was a long stretch between the the the, the late eighties until the early nineties where the Yankees were every year were a horrible team. They were bad until Steinbrenner took took over the team. But they were bad, so you know whatever. Yeah, right, it's going to be. I know that's a, that. I want to say that's a preview for us talking sports. Yep. Uh, we're starting that the two back set podcast. We haven't picked a firm date for start. The AP poll actually for college football comes out next week, so that's when it starts to get real, right? Yep. Because it's only two, we're only three weeks away from week zero at this point, or are we two officially? Uh, I think I think we're officially two weeks away. Officially two weeks away. Three weeks is when the the mother load comes on the first. Yeah, the with second. week one and all the major teams are playing. Week zero, obviously, but, you only get a few few high Thursday profiles. Thursday before, I think there's a couple of sprinkled of, of smaller teams that yeah. are playing on the twenty. So we'll be starting that uh, very soon. So be on the lookout for our Twitter handles for that. I'm at Mr. Warburg. He's at Mr. Fusion or at it's Mr. Fusion. And then we'll have a we'll have a separate handles which I haven't made for those yet. It's the only thing I haven't done is make the social handles for the show. Two back set will be on YouTube. We're gonna probably just record that, not do it live, because if we want to watch like any highlights or anything like that, I don't want to get my live stream account with a, a a dang on it at all. So those licensing things are a bitch, but uh, so we'll deal with that. But uh, if you have any other closing thoughts, we're at just about fifty minutes. A little shorter episode, uh, but I'm yeah, fine with it. Good stuff, man. I mean, Strange New Worlds. I know we we talk it up quite a bit. There's a reason why we wouldn't we wouldn't lie to you. This is we both agree. This is a great show. Um, the other oh, thing is speaking that, of a great show, I completely forgot about this, and I watched the episode today. My Adventures with Superman. Much see, like much like Strange New Worlds, it's just fun. It's just okay, a think, fun interpretation of this mythos and lore, and it's it's on that level of just that it's that good. You, see, you, you all need to watch me. it. I am also on the other side of it, still on the same network though, enjoying season four of Harley Harley Quinn. Oh yeah, even though even though it's really fucking weird with they brought in what's his name Snowflame. Yeah, like, but they're trying to get that peacemaker energy, you know. I know, I know, I know what they're doing, but like Snowflame is uh, guys. If you have, if you he know gets his Snowflame power from is, snorting cocaine. From snorting cocaine, and it's a real character in the comics. Yeah, that's yeah. a real DC character. <laughs> It's fucking wild. But like the show itself is still funny as always. Like I enjoy I enjoy that. So there's some good stuff out there, man. Like definitely jump on. Even with the strike, there's a lot of fun stuff. Yeah. Yeah, DC point, Comics. Like, do cocaine. Do cocaine, right? But you know, the other thing is next week, super excited. The early reviews are Blue Beetle is actually a really good movie. I'm all hyped up for it now. Bought my ticket today. Going to go to the draft house Thursday afternoon. I'm hoping it's it. good because Blue Beetle was a, an awesome character in Young Justice, the show, which yeah. everyone should watch. It's on Max as well. Go watch Young Justice. Great, great interpretation of DC Comics. But I'm curious. I just, some of the CG look, I'm like, you guys are going a little Beetleborgy here, and that's not the character. Smallville did that. I didn't like it so much. Yeah. So, yeah, I think I think I think they overpowered him a bit from just the trailers from what we're seeing, but you know, man, I think like the villains that apparently apparently are lined up, it makes sense for that. But outside of that, I think a little bit. But apparently, it's a good movie, man. It's a good family fun movie. So I'm I'm geeked up about it just because I really like the Jaime Reyes version of the Blue, Blue Beetle that came out yeah. just before the Blackest Night storyline kicked in in the, in the DC universe. So yeah, really happy about that, man. Did you ever watch Shown Justice? No, I need to watch it. Because season two like, is, a, is a subplot with the beetle and the species that made it. Oh, really? Okay. The Reach. Okay. The Reach They're like yeah. the enemies of the Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah. And they make scarabs to go in and like basically kind of infiltrate worlds, a la kind of like Omni-Man in, for Viltrum. Yep. Kind of that kind of subplot. And Blue Beetle factors in heavily into it. And then they go fucking deep. Like the fact that... Uh, I'll spoil it here because uh, yeah. it's, it's an old show. But... The, the scarab that he is is altered by earth magic done 5,000 years ago by the first like lady Isis and okay. a bunch of sorcerers back then who broke its connection to the reach and so it became its own thing and then nobody realized that until 
5,000 years later when Zatanna discovers this temple with the beetle and they start figuring out what the fuck's happening and that's how they end up beating the Reach is they beat they turn all their scarabs against them or really just the one other good to know man I'll have to go back and watch yeah that I, I they that it. show went so deep with the lore I mean that Vandal Savage is a main recurring villain in that show and like they go deep like the fact that like his bloodline is what started Atlantis and like like he, like how they show his powers working over time with his, you know, immortality. So good. That show had no business being that good for airing as a kid show on Cartoon Network when it started. It was awesome. Everyone should watch it. Yes, and Pathos, the Beetleborg theme song is still in my head. I still have my Beetleborg toys somewhere in a house. But, uh, yeah, that, that was certainly a show back then, man. That was What a wild time that was. But speaking of wild times, it's time we wrap up here officially for episode 73. 74 will be right around the corner. We're going to do a justified wrap-up with Nick Schwartz and Christian Young from over at Rooster Teeth. They work in their broadcast department. So we'll be talking justified City Primeval. And then we're going to also wrap up 75. will be the final, for now, episode of the Warper Confusion Entertainment Review. We're going to do our top five movies of all time and hear from our guests which is everyone who's been on the show is going to give us, or at least hopefully, will give us via a Google form their top five movies, and we'll try to react, and I'll try to watch blind as much as I can to get everyone's, you know, responses for their top five movie lists. So that should be a good time. Anything else you want to throw in, Fusion? Uh, no, man. Just enjoy the movies, enjoy the shows, and get ready for a good, uh, good fall of entertainment, including sports. Yeah, heck yeah. We'll get out of here, everybody. See you around. Later.